In this video, Dr. Jordan Grant and Jill T talk about affecting changes to SHBG and the importance of this essential transport protein. Welcome to this channel. If you want to learn more about the most cutting-edge science-based information in the world of hormone optimization, please subscribe and hit that notification bell. So today, in this video, we're talking about the importance of SHBG and affecting changes to it. And we're having Dr. Jordan Grant and Guilty as guests. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Steven. So let's start maybe by first stressing the importance of uh, SHBG. What is it and what is it for? Uh, Gil, you want to take the lead? Sure. So essentially, we know that we have two types of proteins in our bloodstream. And uh, one of them is albumin, which carries and binds to many different things, including medications that we metabolize, uh, as well as sex hormones. Now, albumin-bound testosterone is what's known as bioavailable. Now, what is the difference between bioavailable and free is simple. Free testosterone is the sum of testosterone resulting from unbound T. Unbound meaning SHBG or sex hormone binding globulin and albumin bound. Whatever is unbound is resulting in free. Bioavailable T is the T that is free, unbound, plus albumin bound T. Why? Because albumin bound T is a weak bond and it can be utilized by the body fairly easily with minimal work required. SHBG bound testosterone is extremely difficult for your body to break up and utilize unless it is needed. So it acts more as a buffer and I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit more and Jordan can explain uh, how it acts as a transport mechanism and what other effects it has so people stop thinking that it is unnecessary and attempting to crush it as much as possible. Okay. Um, so why are people always asking on YouTube and other places uh, how to lower SHBG? It seems like it's not a good thing. I think that the biggest factor is uh, you look at the uh, quote unquote natural testosterone boosters or supplement market, and they're always promoting that you need more free testosterone. And while that is true in a sense, it is not a direct clear cut answer. Do we always need more free tea? Not necessarily. As we know, there's a harm, harmonious effect between different hormones, a level of total level of, of free and SHBG has a direct effect on that. So by lowering SHBG, yes, we're freeing up more tea, but we may potentially be inhibiting other aspects where it is needed. We also know that low SHBG is associated with an increased rate of mortality and has a particular um, correlation to insulin resistant. Um, and it's evident when we run labs on type two diabetics and we come up with single digits or low teens on the SHBG. So I think it's really the supplement market that says, well, if you take all this tribulus and boron and sting and nettle root and all these herbs and supplements that are supposed to lower SHBG marginally, you're going to free up more tea. Three of us know that this doesn't really make a dent in the real world, but I think that whole science and notion of lowering SHBG probably originated from there. Um, in the medical aspect, I don't think that most providers who practice TRT um, as a whole actually understand SHBG. Uh, I know most of them don't even test it, but then you have a small pocket of guys that do do it correctly um, and do understand it. And even then, it's, it's not something that's been studied all that much, and there's new... Uh, uh, stuff that's coming out all the time. And really that's the purpose of today's video is to try to understand uh, and explain as much as we do know about it already. Okay. Jordan, what can you tell us about it? Yeah, I agree with what Gil said. Um, I think a lot of it too is from the bodybuilding world. I mean, just from looking at bodybuilding forums for quite a few years now uh, as a hobby, those guys are pretty, they're always talking about taking DHT derivative steroids to lower their SHBG and to get more free hormone um, but it's just more complicated than that. And like I, like Gil said, there's not a lot of great research, especially not when it comes to SHBG and men on TRT and any kind of ideal level or how things are working metabolically. Some of the latest stuff, and this has probably been since 2010, 2015, um, is coming up with this idea though, that SHBG actually does have a function in directing cellular action of hormone. So they found something called the megalin receptor, and it seems to be a receptor that attaches to sex hormone binding globulin as it's bound to testosterone or to hormone, not just testosterone, to sex hormone, and uh, is in, then internalized through the plasma membrane and then can exert cellular, cellular actions. Um, a lot of that's in animal 
uh, cells. A lot of it's in, I think they did it in uh, prostate cancer cells just because they had these cell lines. So it's easy to test this stuff. But as far as ever, you know, testing that directly in humans, I don't think there's any good studies yet, but it's pretty fascinating. Um, I think Gil can talk about this and, and we see it in the forum all the time. It, the low SHBG guys tend to be guys that have more issues, honestly, than the higher ones. Um, and so that's, I think, why we try to get this point across that you don't want to be necessarily crushing your SHBG all the time. Um, I think the reason we see it a lot in the diabetic side is probably because SHBG is made in the liver. Um, and most of those guys end up with liver issues, fatty liver, for example, but liver dysfunction. Um, and that probably is another reason SHBG is crushed in those guys. But what I've seen anecdotally, and there's no good papers on this, um, and Gil can probably attest to this, is lower SHBG guys tend to have more issues with libido, erection issues. Um, when they're on testosterone, they're seeing, and there's a theory here, and I think Dr. Chrysler used to talk about this, about being hyper excreters, guys who had low SHBG. I can't find any good papers on it, but it, it makes sense. I did find a paper on it months ago and I cannot find it. And they mentioned this in diabetics and I cannot find it again, but it was there talking about how they just would excrete uh, testosterone and it would not be used basically when their SHPG was low. So that's, that's kind of pushed me in my practice to get guys with super low SHPG, not, not only to get healthier because a lot of those guys do have diabetes, but not all of them but to do more frequent administrations of their testosterone. And as Gil will talk about, that's not to bring up their SHBG, but it's to make the most and best use of their testosterone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there certain states that also raise SHBG? Yeah, there is. Um, I want to come back to that in a second because I want to touch on what Jordan just said. Okay. Two things. First off, we understand in pharmacokinetics that we're looking for absorption followed by distribution, followed by metabolism, and then finally excretion of a particular medication, in this case, a hormone. Testosterone is absorbed into the body depending on the administration method. The distribution part is where SHBG, I believe, begins its journey by binding to the molecule and then helping to carry it throughout the body. When SHBG is lacking as a transport mechanism, what you're going to to have happen next is you're going to metabolize and excrete the hormone in a more rapid fashion. And that is the hyper excretion that Jordan was reverting to. You're not going to have the same level of steady hormones in a once a week or twice a week protocol of cypionate, for example, if your SHBG is low, because you're excreting faster than you're readministering. When you're going to a daily protocol, you're helping to fix that issue by having less peaks and less valleys and, and more of a flatter curve by introducing the hormone a little more frequently due to the lack of transport mechanism or storage, if you will. So if you think of SHBG as, let's say, frozen food, I buy bulk meat, I throw it in my freezer, that's my SHBG. I could always take one or two pounds of chicken a day and move them into the fridge to defrost them before cooking, but I have my stockpile. When the stockpile runs low, I'm basically out of food until I go shopping again, right? So that is number one. The second thing is, the inhibition of um, SHBG by androgens, okay, the crushing effect of androgens will always be present with androgen use. When you take an exogenous testosterone, your SHBG will go down. If you're doing it a day, twice a day, which I know no one does, I'm just exaggerating, you're doing it twice a day, you're doing it twice a week, once a week. Here is where the daily protocol helps. And you have to kind of understand this and follow me here. Daily injections do not increase SHBG. What they do is they have a smaller inhibiting effect on SHBG. So think about that for a minute. They're not directly causing the number to rise. They're causing it to not drop as much as if we did it once a week. And why is that? It's not the frequency. It's dose dependent. Now, if I have 100 milligrams per week, or let's just for simplicity say 140 milligrams per week, I can take 20 per day, which means every administration is 20, or I could take 140 in one shot. Without getting into the pharmacodynamics of half-lives, which is a whole other topic, the 140 is going to have a great crushing effect on SHBG and drop that number dramatically. That may be good for guys with 
hyper SHBG levels. For guys who already have low levels due to either genetic predisposition, insulin resistance, or diabetes, you want to give them every fighting chance to allow that number to come up, and we can get into ways of actually raising it metabolically, as well as with possible supplements. But before we do that, we have to understand that while we're trying to raise it, we need to also prevent the inhibition of the protein. And the way we do that is by taking that 140 milligrams, still giving us the same dose for the week, but administering much smaller doses at a time to give it a chance to come up. So that's one point I wanted to make. And then if you wanted to go into the actual ways of raising it, then uh, you know, we, we could certainly go over those as well. I asked about certain states that would raise SHBG, uh, for example, uh, overtraining or uh, severe caloric uh, restriction, for example. We know that there are certain liver conditions that modulate SHBG because that's where it's produced. So under stressful liver conditions, we know SHB tends to rise. We know that under glucose metabolism or increased insulin blood levels, SHBG tends to lower. So if someone is extremely low or extremely high, prior to attempting to affect the change to their number, we should first try to figure out why it's happening because there's an opportunity there to catch an underlying issue or disease before you affect change and mask it, right? So someone may have a non-alcoholic fatty liver, someone may have hepatitis, someone may have some sort of uh, uh, inflammation caused by a non-viral issue. So it's important to note, I've seen, especially in women, which tend to have higher SHBG numbers than men, and especially those that are a little bit older, I've seen SHBGs in the 200s. And the first thing I want to do is figure out why before I attempt to crush it. It's very easy to crush it with medication. The question is, why is it there in the first place? Are we missing a greater problem to begin with? Or are we missing insulin resistance in a case of a low? You know how many guys come in and we say, are you diabetic? No. Are you pre-diabetic? No. Are you insulin resistant? No. You run the labs. A1C comes back at 5.9 or 6.0. They say, what's that? I've never tested it. They don't even know. So it's important to kind of diagnose that first and assess what's going on here and fix the underlying issue rather than mask it with medication in the hopes that you're just fixing a problem that you never really address. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that's why I say a lot of guys are thinking of it the wrong way. They're thinking of just changing the SHBG for, that, for its own sake instead of trying to figure out why is the SHBG what it is. Maybe nothing, maybe just their genetic, genetically determined SHBG, but it's good to look into that. And I agree, if you see a super low or even a really crazy high, it's good to just rule out other issues. I mean, I've seen a couple guys, their SHBG was 110, 120, and their free T was nothing. And they had symptoms of low T, even though their total was 800. And one guy, I did a full workup, liver, thyroid, everything. He came back fine. Um, and we just treated him with testosterone twice a week. And I mean, after six weeks, his SHBG had already gone down into the seventies, kept going down after that, but he felt better with the higher free T. Um, and it's the same for the low guys. I will say there's probably a point of diminishing returns for injections as far as the frequency. I know a lot of guys like the daily, but and it depends on everybody's metabolism as far as what their true kind of excretion half-life is. Cause it's not just the half-life you look up on Google. There's multiple factors that affect the half-life of cypionate or enanthate. And that's why I think a lot of guys, even with low SHBG, they can still do twice a week injections or let's say three times a week and still be okay and metabolize. Cause at some point you're going to hit a steady state for the most part with those longer acting esters. And so then in anything more than that, as far as more frequent, is it going to change that steady state? And so then you're not really getting, you know, the benefit of that for more frequent administration. Now, if they're doing cream or something a more fast acting. Yeah. I mean, that, you got to do it daily, you know, some guys twice daily, but I just wanted to make that point there. There probably is a point of diminishing returns of the frequent injections, um, but just because of the way the drug works in the body, reaching a steady state. That's all. You know, going back to the old conversation of creams versus injections, one of the biggest benefits on in injections here over cream is that without the intervention of further medications, we can often resolve SHBG issues just by changing cypionate frequency, especially when the issue is being on the high side and we want to lower it. We can go once a week for a month or two get it down to optimal levels and then go back to twice a week. Uh, we can go to twice a week or three times a week if they're on daily. You don't have that luxury with creams. 
you're not going to affect changes to SHBG with an androgenic effect on a cream. You're going to have to introduce another method in order to attempt yeah, it. Unless it, it would take a long time on that androgen to bring it down. Yeah. Um, it's a and, very and stubborn there, hormone. When you crush it, it takes a long time to come back. Yeah. You know, and when, you, when it's high, you know, it takes a little bit less to bring it down. But guys that crush it, you know, especially with insulin resistance, it could take six months or a year to really optimize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I've seen, um, you know, I think Dr. Nichols always talked about, you know, don't chase SHBG, which I agree. They would say you can just overcome high SHBG with higher doses. Interestingly, a lot of guys, this is all anecdotal, by the way, in the forum have talked about if their SHB is high, they tend to feel better with a lower total T. And I can't figure that out. And I've had multiple guys talk about that on there. So I've racked my brain trying to come up with different theories of, okay, for low SHBG guys, do they maybe need, they've already got a good free T, but maybe they need a higher total T to still have that buffer effect. Maybe these higher SHBG guys, even though their free is not as good, they've got that buffer effect going on and it's still, you know, I don't know the answer. Like, it, I think it's fascinating. I think that could be a little related to sensory adaptation. You've lived with a high SHBG for so long genetically. And as a result, you're accustomed to being at a particular free T level, which has probably always been suboptimal. And then as soon as you introduce exogenous T, all of a sudden they're feeling an effect. Whereas if you increase the dose too soon, you run the risk of, you know, hyper anxiety and all these other, yeah. you, know, the, the, you know, the free T levels that you and I enjoy, you give that to someone who's lived at 110 SHBG for 20 years with a free T of four, yep. you know, you give them a free T of 50 or 60 and that guy's not going to sleep at night. I agree. So I think that could be more of climbing the ladder and, and yeah. kind of adapting. Yeah. And I, I see that with guys and I'll try to maybe introduce them a little and not overdo it at first, you know, slam them with whatever dose. Uh, you just got to be more careful with those guys because they, they definitely may have more anxiety. But then I've always wondered too, the low SHB guys, do they have more anxiety issues because their free T goes up? I mean, it goes up as well because um, they, they may still have an okay free T when they start, but it's usually not great. I mean, these guys 10, 12, maybe instead of four or five, you get them on treatment and they're going from, you know, 25 to 40 or 50. Right. Free tea. You know, those, those low SHPG guys, they're starting with a free T of 10 or 12, but their total T is like 180 or 200. I know. And you're looking at it and you're like, man, your free T is 10% of your total. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and it's funny because they'll start and they'll say, I feel a little bit better, but I still have no libido. You know, what's going on? Well, your SHPG is at seven. Right. You know, and I think that's where the other aspects come in. Yeah. And that's just tells me you need both. You need a, you need the, the SHBG has a function, not that I fully understand what it is yet, but we can't just say free. I think the free hormone hypothesis has been questioned in enough papers now to say it's not just the free hormones that are biologically active at any one time. Because if, like you said earlier, if all you had were free hormone, you would simply not be able to utilize it uh, all at the proper time, just be a hyper excreter. So there is, there's a balance and there's a reason we have SHPG, obviously. I would, I would, I would basically analyze this as, uh, you know, the difference between blood glucose and glycogen both have a purpose, right? It's not just about blood glucose. That's right. right? The, the stored glucose has a purpose as well, yep. whether it's immediate or whether it is to be used as bad. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I wish there was more papers on it. I think hopefully somebody will start doing that with, it has to be with people on TRT. Like that's what we need. We need to start looking at guys on TRT, different levels of SHPG, look at excretion, glucuronidation, all that stuff to see what's going on with them. And maybe in 10 years, we'll know more what we're talking about. So we can affect change to the SHBG level uh, by adapting the frequency and dosage of the testosterone administration. Are there any other ways of uh, affecting those changes, uh, Gil? Yeah, so there is a couple, and that would be through medication. And unfortunately, and I'm, I'm sure Jordan agrees, and I wish that one day this would change, but it's probably more political than anything. Um, Bayer makes a medication called Proviron, which is used all around the world with the exception of the United States. Um, outside of vitamin D3, I believe it is the only non-C17 alpha alkylated uh, sex hormone or steroid that is non-anabolic, yet still serves a good purpose in the body. It binds very tightly. It is a DHT derivative, but it is non-anabolic. It does not survive the first liver pass and it loses its anabolic properties. So unlike oxandrolone, which is a very similar compound that has a similar effect, but yet is anabolic, proviron is not. And proviron is often prescribed at 25 to 50 milligrams a day. 
in many parts of Europe alongside TRT. And its sole purpose is they call it a libido booster. I believe that what it was originally approved for and what Baylor tutored it for was that it is, and Jordan can correct me if I'm wrong, it is an FSH mimicker and it is designed as a male fertility drug. And that was initially what it was sold under. And uh, it, has a, it does a very good job at lowering SHBG. The problem is that a lot of guys who you run it, you know, sort of indefinitely will report improved libido initially, and then that'll taper off over time. And I believe that that's because they're passing from a high SHBG state into an optimal state and then further crashing into that suboptimal state. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think it is something that needs to be modulated as needed. Um, it should not be used as a <laughs> indefinite lifelong, you know, TRT companion. It should be a PRN drug and it should be um, monitored uh, both in terms of subjective assessments with the patient as, long as, as well as SHBG labs. So I'm curious what Jordan feels about it. Yeah, as far as the FSH part, I'm not sure. I just I know they used looked at it for fertility issues at first, but I think when you're on it long enough, it still suppresses uh, your gonadotropins if you're on it long enough. Um, so it didn't really Yes, yeah. but just like SHC, HCG suppresses LH, but it mimics it, I believe, and we got to look at it. Uh, it could yeah, be I need to look it up. Yeah. I believe that it mimics FSH because it does increase uh, sperm production. It did, and I need to look at that study again. I agree. I can't remember what the mechanism was, but yeah, I think you're right, though. Certainly, over, yeah. yeah. Over time, um, guys do tend to, and they looked at it as monotherapy. There was a good study okay. I saw where they tried it, and it, it just doesn't pan out because you still need testosterone and estradiol. George for, Tuliatos out of Greece prescribes it as monotherapy for guys who have um, normal, quote unquote, normal T levels, but elevated SHBG levels. I think he'll try it for four to six weeks and see if he can regulate SHBG down where they free up more T and then come off. Right with minimal to no suppression, but long-term, I think any, any androgen is going to suppress. Yeah, I agree. And, and like you said, the libido boosting tends to be transient. Uh, I see that in guys I've talked to on anabolic steroids, the same with uh, Masteron. They want to add Masteron, like even just a hundred milligrams a week to their TRT because it helps their libido, but it doesn't last. Um, you're skewing the ratio of DHT to testosterone estradiol when you do that. Anytime you take an exogenous substance, it's not testosterone, you're messing those ratios up. And so it's just a crapshoot as far as how you're going to feel on it. Yeah, DHT is extremely responsible for libido. However, the exogenous derivatives tend to literally triple it in a short yeah. period of time because they're oral. And I think they, they work very fast and they triple it and you'll go through that honeymoon phase and exit it very quickly. And well, then and the, it, other, the other reason is they act as aromatase inhibitors and people don't realize that. And yeah. they can be very powerful. I mean, people say it's, bro, it's a myth that Masteron can actually lower estradiol. It can. Uh, Masteron so, was the original aromatase yeah. inhibitor before yeah. anastrozole was even developed. Yeah. Masteron was approved as a breast cancer medication right. for the sole purpose of crushing estrogen. Right. And then discontinued in the 90s upon the introduction of oral administration because women did not want the injections. Right. And I've seen it crush estradiol on lab work on guys I've known taking it. And uh, that's going to destroy libido after a while. I mean, we know estradiol helps libido as well. So guys need to... Not just libido, but erectile function as well. That's right. Blood and flow. What, what do bodybuilders use Masteron for pre-contest? Hardening and drawing. That's right. In a way of less water retention via lower E2. So it's just, and proviron is much weaker than Mastron, but it can still act as an aromatase inhibitor. Any, any androgen, any steroid can act as an aromatase inhibitor. And this is a tangent, but people need to understand this. Um, because they're closely related to testosterone, they can bind aromatase, but they themselves cannot be aromatized. Even nandrolone can bind aromatase, but cannot really be aromatized. So people need to understand anytime they're taking exogenous anabolics and all that, you, you need to think about what you're doing as far as what it's going to do to your estradiol and, and all the things that we always talk about. So, mm -hmm. And while you're on the topic of estradiol, SHBG also has a binding effect to, to estrogens as well. Yes. yes. Although I believe it is stronger on androgens. I think so. Um, yeah. And there's a, there's a lot less E2 bound SHBG than there is the T, I think. I've read, I don't know, I've read so many papers on this recently, but, and I think E2 may stimulate the production of SHBG if I, if I, if I'm not mistaken. And 
I have to go back. Guys, always talk about gynecomastia, and I know we've beat a dead horse with this a million times that it is not necessarily E2 and it is not directly E2, but it's a combination of things. Um, But I do believe that a lower SHBG allowing for more free E2 um, can be a catalyst for guys who are already susceptible. I think crushing SHBG will just increase that risk. Yeah. And I've seen that on guys taking DHT derivatives before that get gyno and they're their estradiol is not high, but the thing is, again, the ratio, the intracellular, all these things going on. So it's a, it's a fine little dance going on. I think this is one of the problems with trenbolone is guys don't understand that it has a dramatic crushing effect on estradiol yep. while increasing progestins. Yeah. Yep. And that is probably the most common gynecomastia inducing androgen. Yep. Absolutely. And not only that, probably directly stimulating progestin receptors as well. So, um, Anyway, we're off topic. With this oh, yeah. <laughs> Any other way to affect uh, changes to it, SHBG? Yeah, Gil, Gil talks about, don't you talk about low carbohydrate versus high carbohydrate? Yeah, so, so remember, insulin has an antagonistic effect on SHBG. So when you have a constant and chronic state of uh, hyperinsulin in your, in your serum, um, you're going to lower SHBG fairly rapidly and aggressively, which results back to why diabetics and insulin resistant patients have low SHBG numbers. So what do we do to fix that? You suppress your insulin as much as possible for a short period. Again, understand that the primary goal here is affecting changes to SHBG. It is not body composition. It is not performance. It is not weight loss. So when I say the word, quote unquote, ketogenic diet, okay, I say it with my tongue in my cheek and I'm cringing on one side of my head because guys are always, oh, he said keto diet. No, this is not for your performance aesthetics or or fat loss. This is for the purpose of elevating SHBG. You are going to suppress or inhibit your insulin production for a short period. And you're also going to improve your insulin sensitivity by doing so. So it's a double whammy effect in your favor. And while doing that, you can also use essential fatty acids that are healthy, like extra virgin olive oil in its raw form, do not heat it up. If you look at some of the the European nations like Greece and Italy, they tend to have higher SHBG numbers than we do. And it is not due to liver disease. It is due to the uh, essential fatty acid lifestyle. They're not eating pastas, you know, like we are all day. They're eating, you know, cheeses and olive oils and and olives and and things of that sort, avocados and whatnot. Uh, And that type of food will elevate SHBG. So a tablespoon a day of raw extra virgin olive oil while inhibiting your carbohydrate intake for four to six weeks should have a positive effect on elevating SHBG. At the very least, it's going to have a positive effect on improving insulin sensitivity and or reversing a pre-diabetic state. Okay. Uh, Jordan? That's all I know on that as well, as far as diet or any other way to... What about supplements? People are always talking boron. I'll be honest with you. I haven't looked into because I'm pretty much against crushing your SHBG on purpose. I don't really look into that stuff because I try to get a bigger, I'm more of a principles guy than a minutia on some things. Um, and if my principle is just like the Rome taste inhibitors thing, like I, I'm not going to use them. So people will say, well, which one is better? You know, letrozole or Romacin. I don't, it doesn't matter because I don't use them, but yeah, boron, <laughs> yeah, I mean, boron, all that stuff. Could it affect it? Yeah. I mean, Again, you start chasing your tail uh, if you're trying to manipulate it on purpose and not looking at the underlying reason that your SHBG is a certain way. Your SHBG may not be an issue at all. I mean, it, it may not. I think a lot of times, as long as you're healthy, you've ruled out insulin resistance, you've ruled out liver disease, thyroid issues, all that stuff, your SHBG is what it is. And then you just need to find the dose of frequency of testosterone administration that gets you symptom resolution, which is what we talk about all the time. It's exactly. really not... I mean, we're, we're making it academic today because I think this stuff's important, but it's not as much of a rocket science as people make it out to be. Because if you truly try to titrate dose and frequency to symptom resolution, usually you can do that with most guys. If you've fixed their other issues as well, like we talk about insulin resistance is a huge, huge issue in this country and probably worldwide, but especially the U.S. And we need to be hammering that to death, honestly. Mm-hmm. It is primarily a U.S. issue, and it's becoming worldwide because of the Americanization of... Western diet. The, yeah. I mean, you go, listen, I grew up overseas. I only moved here in the mid-80s when I was like in the fourth grade, and 
I could tell you it was the first time I'd ever experienced fast food and overweight people. Um, you know, guys back in the seventies and whatnot, and used to wear speedos on the beach. And it was mm -hmm. the first time I saw swimming trunks was in America. And I was like, well, why are people? And then I realized, well, everybody's overweight. And this is even back then. And today it's much worse. Now, when I go back, uh, you know, I just spent a couple of uh, weeks in Europe this past summer with my wife and it amazed me. I mean, it's literally like you feel you walking down New York City. There's a Starbucks and McDonald's. And it's like, yeah. what happened to the authenticity? Every, every, everybody's trying to mimic the American culture around the world. And that is why the diabetes is spreading. It is not the typical culture of some of these countries, mm -hmm. uh, but it is, it's spreading. And yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a drastic problem. People don't understand quite how serious and how bad diabetes is we take it for granted we take it as a norm you know being obese and overweight has already for 20 years been tutored as the norm and it's mm -hmm. okay and the whole thing would fa look I'm, I'm i'm not it's not okay to ever bully anyone but the whole fat shaming thing um made it not okay to criticize someone for an unhealthy lifestyle or for right. bringing themselves a state of chronic disease because god forbid you should comment on on someone's weight yep. when when they have a bmi of 40 um you know, and ultimately it's killing people. I mean, yeah. <laughs> we're worried about a virus going around right now. You know, the virus is within us. And if you look around the society, the diabetes and obesity is, that's that's the real virus. In I the agree. Country. I totally agree. And if all, I'm, it's political, but if half these people that claim they cared about these lives of virus victims, if they really did, they cared about lives, they'd be out every day protesting. Too all much the, money. Too much yeah. money in treatments. They'd be protesting. The longer I can keep you alive and feed you statins and hypertension yeah. medication and, and, and metformin and insulin, the more money I make. It's, it, it drives me nuts. I mean, it really does. And I mean, I see it in my practice. I don't know how many people are insul insulin resistant, um, but the, the spectrum of chronic disease that that leads to is just unbelievable. People do not understand what a big deal it is. Um, so they need to, I mean, as far as cardiovascular risk factors, that's one of the top ones that was smoking. I mean, and most of these people do both. Um, so we get them for the erection. We get them for yeah. the erectile dysfunction. Yeah. Yep, and then we get guys, we had a guy this week, nerve damage in his hands, can't can't fill out his intake forms. We had the front desk do it because he can't hold a pen. Yep. Diabetes. Yep. Uh, we had a guy with missing feet, diabetes. Um, all of them with you know circulatory issues, diabetes. Absolutely. Um, you know, can't optimize their TRT, diabetes. Um, it's it's a common denominator. Yep, I agree. I mean, we see it the same reason ED, uh, non-functioning bladders, their neuropathy on their bladder doesn't work anymore. They can't empty. They got to catheterize themselves. Um, it's just amazing. So that's, again, another tangent, but it ties into the SHPG thing, I think, pretty well. And mm -hmm. so a lot of these guys, if they have very low, and they don't have to be obese. There are people that are genetically prone to getting type 2 diabetes, and it may not be their lifestyle. If their SHPG is seven or, you know, something single digit, they need to have a, a checkup to see if they're insulin resistant for sure. Um, so they need to rule that out. Yeah. Sure. Anything more you wanted to add to this uh, very topic, uh, Gil? The takeaway from this would be stop worrying about crushing SHBG. Worry about fixing nutrition, exercise, lifestyle habits. Most of your issues that you think you have are going to normalize at that point. Most of your numbers and your symptoms are going to normalize at that point, assuming you're doing everything else optimally. And if you still have issues, it's going to be a much easier task to tackle them once you've eliminated so many of the underlying factors that are likely causing it in the first place. The more we eliminate variables, the easier it is to put a finger at what's remaining. Absolutely. I mean, diagnosis is all about eliminating variables until you have one left. Yeah, yeah I agree. It's, it's much harder to dial people in when they're unhealthy and they have like say diabetes liver dysfunction thyroid dysfunction chronic kidney disease i mean the works and you don't really know what you're doing is affecting what they're already on 40 medicines so that affects the other thing else how they feel so then they say well testosterone just doesn't work for me and all this it's like well, you just you got a lot going on you got polypharmacy basically and i see that a lot too so get yourself keep yourself healthy it <laughs> should be the topic of this honestly because it's much easier to dial yourself in on TRT if you're a healthy person otherwise. So. You know, the problem is when someone is quote unquote healthy and they feel good, they don't come in and ask about TRT. It's usually the older guys and, and older guys already have a polypharmacy risk based on the fact that they've been on seven different medications for 15 years. That's true. Yep. 
I talk to all of them about do. I mean, I know they're not going to do it, but I try to at least encourage them. Watch what you eat. Start tracking your calories because they. A lot of these guys want. They realize that they're in a bad spot, and they're early, you know they're in their fifties, getting overweight, and that's when we have to have the diet discussion and all that. And then we start arguing calories and they say, yeah, I'm doing everything I can and I'm cutting my breads and my sugars and I'm not losing fat. And I was like, well, it's because you're still eating too much. And anyway, that's a whole separate discussion. I know my pet peeve and I'm sure it's yours as well. But when I hear I eat clean or I eat healthy, yep, that's the first red flag. I hear it every day. <laughs> yep, it is. And, and if they say I'm eating 1200 calories and I'm not losing fat and they're 250 pounds, I'm saying mm -hmm. you're not eating 1200 calories. Mm -hmm. That's just, yeah. So we've identified two issues. Number one is you're overweight. Number two, you suck at math. Yeah. Yeah. And tracking and just nobody wants to track. I mean, they really don't. I mean, I, when I bring it up and I say, you've tried everything, have you bought a food scale? And their eyes just glaze over and they're like, well, I'm not going to do that. And I'm like, okay. See, if you remember, Stephen, the video we did about nutrition, what was the number one priority I said above all the scientific ones was adhering, right? People are not going to adhere to counting calories and weighing their food and, and meal prepping. Heck, I could tell you when I was competing, it was tough enough to do, and it was a priority for me, let alone uh, an average person who uses terms like I eat clean, and now you're asking them to weigh their food. Yeah. So understanding that a failure in adherence means that it is absolutely worth zero. What I do when I coach guys on nutrition is I don't tell them eat X amount of calories, X amount of protein, X amount of carbs, mm -hmm. and weigh your food. What I do is I actually do that for them. So I will tell them meal number one is going to be four egg whites, one whole egg, half a cup of oatmeal and a banana. Yeah. Meal number two is six ounces of chicken and one cup of rice. Meal number three, the, it's already done. So yeah. now all they got to do is say, oh, okay, well, here's a palm sized yeah. chicken breast and here's a cup of rice. Boom. Yeah. yeah. So, and then they got no excuses. Well, uh, if, if I've done my <laughs> job in filtering their interview process correctly, they have no excuse. <laughs> yeah. But I would say eight out of 10 people that I interview to work with on a nutritional basis, I disqualify. And it has nothing to do with their starting point. It has to do with their mindset. Yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. They want the result, but they'll never do what it takes to get there. Yeah. So I try, I try to disqualify early on. Gotcha. Excellent. Right. Thank you so much Trev, for covering this uh, topic. Uh, Jordan Gill, thanks. Always thanks. a pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.